Good morning. Good to see you this morning, and uh, it's good to be here. And uh, <laughs> a couple things I do want to mention, those uh, baby bottles that were collected, there's still about four of them out there, so we need to get them, even if you haven't filled them up or whatnot, get them back. So uh, get them back to Rose, and uh, uh, she would appreciate that so we can get that taken care of. Um, We've been praying for the young lady from uh, North Branch, the little girl that had drowned, Olivia, and we heard an update that she, uh, the family would like to be taking her home and she'll be obviously on life support, but there is some uh, a hope there. Apparently she's had some movements uh, that are uh, purposeful and, and uh, so we're still praying for a miracle for that family and for that little girl and uh, never be shy to pray for God to do great things. Uh, pray for people for years and years if you have to, and sometimes the Lord uh, does uh, end up proving a miracle. So uh, we're gonna continue to lift uh, Olivia uh, Makinka up to the Lord, and uh, we need to talk about something else, and, and it needs to be uh, a prayer that's on our hearts, but uh, uh, Friday, uh, I believe it was, uh, the Supreme Court reversed uh, the Roe versus Wade decision that had been the law of the land for uh, 50 years, uh, essentially. And uh, a lot of Christians are definitely rejoicing. I'm definitely pleased by that. It's something that uh, we've prayed about, and uh, certainly as a pastor, I've talked about for many years uh, how evil and terrible uh, abortion is, the purposeful taking of a human life in the womb. And uh, so that's that's uh, gone, right? And it's going to be up to the states. And uh, we've already heard rumors that some states have already shut down abortion clinics because of old laws that were on the books. I've heard uh, Wisconsin, uh, they've had to shut them down and vacate them. And I've heard Texas and Oklahoma are very close behind. And uh, uh, But we live in the state of Michigan that is considered a, uh, they call this a blue state with a uh, Democrat governor and attorney general that are already uh, saying we're not going to allow this to happen and, and on and on and on. So uh, we definitely need to be in prayer uh, for that. We uh, value human life, right? As believers, especially as Baptists and, and Christians, we value human life. And that's something that we uh, stand up and, and defend is the, those little babies. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about this morning, and, and I was tempted to actually scrap my entire sermon and just talk about this because um, there's different protesters, uh, non-believers, uh, obviously, uh, from the leftist persuasion that are saying, and I don't know if you've seen this or heard this, but they are saying, we demand this is a religious right to kill babies. And they were uh, hailing Satan and saying they were Satanists. Uh, they're chanting this, demanding this. It's all on video. We could have definitely shown the videos. I, I don't know if we could have. The language might be too bad for church. Uh, there's other groups that are saying, uh, publicly saying that they are planning to uh, go to the rural areas uh, because it's the rural Christian people that are, are behind uh, the anti-abortion movement, the pro-life movement. And we need to stop rioting in the cities and burning down the cities and go to the rural areas because they are, quote, defenseless. Uh, so, uh, you're, Lyle's up here laughing. Uh, that's the same thing I thought when I read that. And uh, so I just wanted us to be aware uh, what those folks out there are, are saying and what they think. And uh, we don't have anything against what their belief system is. We just value human life. Uh, we believe that life starts at the moment of conception. And uh, that's what we prayed for. That's what we wanted. Uh, I personally don't know anyone that has, you know, gone to Washington, D.C. and marched in some pro-life rally. I know they have them. That's, that's not the type of personality we have. Uh, so we literally want them to leave us alone and let us believe what we want to believe and we're going to let them believe what they want to believe. That's traditional Baptist uh, 
whatever the fundamentals of the Baptists are, B A P T. We can look at that some other day. Uh, but uh, we believe in that and uh, uh, individual soul liberty. Uh, but uh, I just wanted you folks to be aware. Uh, I know some Catholic churches have been vandalized. Uh, and a couple of crisis pregnancy centers were uh, lit on fire yesterday. I don't know how widespread the damage was or, or what it was, but uh, we just need to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ all across the country that even for this Sunday morning, there might be a different protest planned at churches. And, and these people are trying to get coordinated and organized uh, to, to go after believers in the rural areas. So I just want you to be in prayer. Uh, not only for our brothers and sisters around the, the country that might be dealing with this, but uh, just to be in prayer for God's wisdom for your own self and your own safety. And uh, um, and uh, definitely be in prayer for those little babies that uh, uh, we are definitely trying to uh, save from being murdered in the womb. And of course, all of this is online. So uh, when we think we are safe, uh, somebody can access this on Facebook and on YouTube and see our my comments and see what we believe as a church uh, so uh, I Think the threat is is very minimal, but I still wanted us to to talk about it and, and bring it up Just uh, so we're aware as a community of believers of what's going on out there So uh, let's do that this morning. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes and it's just not the pastor praying uh, but this is a, uh, a group prayer, so pray along with me as we go to the Lord this morning. Father God, we are definitely thankful uh, for those Supreme Court justices that uh, stood up for uh, the lives of the unborn there on Friday. And, and Lord, uh, it seems like on the surface like a, a great victory, uh, but Lord, we know that Satan doesn't give out or allow victories in this world uh, without uh, something else going on. So, Father, we don't know what's going to happen next, what's going to come down the pipe, but, Father, we are thankful that you do. We are thankful that we do not have to fear what lies ahead. Father, we are also aware of the different threats that have taken place. So, Father, I think of our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, around the country that uh, are running these crisis pregnancy centers. We think of the one in Flint and uh, those, those men and women that faithfully ministered to the ladies, we think of the one in Lapeer as well. Uh, we pray for your uh, protection on those two facilities. We think of the other churches and the other uh, Christians that are out on the street corners and, and holding up signs for pro-life that uh, people would see those messages and, and come speak to them and maybe uh, come to Christ because of their witness. And Lord, even us this coming week, as we might have opportunities to discuss with somebody uh, our position and our stance. Uh, may uh, the message, the gospel message of your son be in that conversation as well. And uh, may we uh, have boldness to be able to share with somebody that uh, their need to repent, uh, not just believe in Jesus Christ, but to repent and turn from their sins and believe with their whole heart that he died and rose again. And Father, may that, that message be on in our conversation and on the tip of our tongues this week. Lord, we also lift up some of those uh, in our midst with health issues, uh, with David getting his postponed his procedures for further testing. We think of Olivia, and uh, we've been praying for her for a long time now. And Lord, we're going to continue to pray the same thing over and over, that a miracle would take place and that your glory would shine through. And Lord, even that uh, someday in 15 to 20 years that Olivia is actually going around to youth groups and churches telling her testimony and her story about uh, how you uh, brought her back uh, from, from so far gone. And Lord, we know you are powerful. We know you can do it. We know you've done it in the past. We, we pray confidently that you would do that for Olivia. Lord, we think of uh, others that are, are missing in our midst, and uh, we think of those that are traveling this morning as well, that you, know, you would give them safety on the road. And uh, Lord, as we look in the book of Acts once again this morning, uh, just open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Three hundred 
172. <laughs> First epistle of John, towards the back. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. I read, and you follow along. I'm reading in the New King James Version, so Pew Bibles, page 902. You guys look beautiful. All smiley faces and everything. Well, thank you. <laughs> Pastor should have wore a tie. <laughs> this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, please. May the ushers come forward. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we're thankful to be in your house in this Lord's Day and so thankful to be in fellowship with one another. And Lord, we just give back just a portion of what you blessed us with that we may further the gospel, further your word in all four corners of the world. And we're just so thankful that uh, this community we can give back to and this community we can be a lighthouse with. So we just thank you today and worship you again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn to the chorus 370, into my heart, 370. Stand as we sing.
over the last few weeks that we've been studying the book of Acts, we've had different sort of invitations or whatever challenges at the end of the service. And I just wanted to know we don't have a lot of people that necessarily come forward. Uh, but I did hear from somebody that wants to get baptized. So here in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully, that'll take place. And I've also heard from some people that want to uh, join the church. So uh, when they uh, end up meeting with the deacons and uh, we'll be presenting them as, as members uh, very soon. So uh, that's just uh, some good things uh, to hear and, and uh, uh, we're excited about that. So find the book of Acts. We've been studying Acts chapter 2 and we've seen the gift of the Holy Spirit come upon the people and we've seen how they went outside and began sharing the message of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Uh, if you recall, they didn't uh, stop to have a business meeting and vote on anything. They didn't uh, plan an outreach event. They just went outside and told people about Jesus. And of course, we also see that eventually in the middle of that, uh, Peter stands up and he preaches the very first church sermon and uh, it's uh, uh, using a text from the book of Joel, and there's two passages from the book of Psalms that he quotes. But verse 36 is his closing statement in his sermon. He points at them, and he looks at them, and loudly says, You killed Jesus, and he was both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says that the people that heard that were convicted, and they asked the perfect question, What shall we do? It says, many people in the crowd asked Peter and the apostles, what should we do? And of course, you see as you're looking there and following along in the scriptures, Peter says, you just do you. You get your life straightened out the best way you possibly can. You know, I, I, what I want you to do is, is try really, really hard. No, that's not what he says, is it? What should we do? And Peter says, follow along with me. What does he say? He says, bow your heads and close your eyes. Bow your heads and close your eyes. There's no one looking around. Is, is that some kind of Jedi mind trick that pastors do? <laughs> you know, I've said it myself a few times, and I've uh, thought about it as I read this passage. Why did... Have I even ever said that in the past? And the only thing I can think of is, well, I've heard other people do it. Uh, but, but Peter didn't say that either. When the people said, what should we do? People, Peter says, repent. Right? Peter says, turn away from your sins and run to Jesus. He says, every one of you needs to repent and then get baptized. And it says that day... 3,000 people were saved. And we thought about it last week. Just imagine it with me. Every pool in Jerusalem, every fountain, every available spot of water was being used for baptisms. Uh, 3,000 that day. Let's pick up the story in verse 41. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So there in verse 40, we didn't necessarily read that, but we see that Peter kept preaching over and over again. Uh, his sermon wasn't necessarily a short one. It was a long one. And he kept repeating over and over again, be saved from this perverse generation. You know, in the book of Acts, there are no bow your heads and close your eyes invitations. It's always, you're dying. You're going to hell unless you repent and, and be saved. 
You know, I think if Peter and Andrew and those other fellas saw us today, they might say, if people are only willing to make a decision for Jesus while no one is looking around, is that real discipleship? Are they really taking up their cross and following Jesus? You know, when I was writing this message uh, the other day, I didn't really intend to preach on cheesy things that pastors say. But I think we need to take note of what the first church did. A lot of times we, we, we try to reinvent the wheel when all we really need to do is preach Christ from the Word of God and then at the moment of decision tell people, you need to repent. Listen up, guys. Just want you to keep me accountable here. If I ever start, uh, if I forget all of this and start going on with this bow your head, close your eyes business, no one is looking around, start clearing your throats. Be like, <clears throat> and snap me out of it, okay? I know, I know Tony will do that if I start saying that, okay? Uh, uh, because what we really need to do is, is without fear, if we're going to make a decision for Christ, uh, step out of our seat and make a change by turning to Jesus Christ in front of everyone. So Peter said, he says, repent, be baptized, and be saved from this perverse generation. So as we look at this passage, don't clear, I didn't do anything wrong. I just heard somebody clearing your throat. I didn't, just, okay, I'm just messing with you. Uh, so as we look at this passage over again, I'm hit with the fact that this is a perfect picture of the gospel-centered community. And we see that they go from uh, the, the first church service starts off with 120 people, and they end it with 3,120 people, as thousands of people are baptized all over the city. And this verse 41 says they are added to the church. And please note, uh, that, that there is a list of the necessities of a gospel-centered community. Because this is the start of something great here, and we need to see what they are doing if we also want to do something great. Well, what we see these are they were dedicated to the teaching of the Word of God. They were dedicated to biblical fellowship. They were far, faithfully participating in the Lord's Supper. And finally, they were praying for one another. Now, there's always a temptation as we read a passage from Scripture uh, uh, to see an application and to think, oh boy, Henry really needs to hear that. Or Ralph, I, I really hope he's listening. Let's try not to do that today. Instead, as we read this passage and think about this passage, we need to ask, is this important to me? What we need to do this morning is ask, Am I listening to this? Am I dedicated to the teaching of the Word of God? And am I committed to fellowship? Am I seeking unity in God's will together with my church family through communion and, and praying? Verse 42. So the first act necessary to be a gospel-centered community is to continue steadfastly in the uh, apostles' doctrine. You might be saying, well, what's, what's that? Well, you have a copy of the Apostles' Doctrine in your lap or on your phone. The Apostles' Doctrine is the New Testament. That is a record of the Apostles' Doctrine. Now notice that the verse says that the people in the first church, these first followers of Jesus Christ, continued steadfastly. Did you see that? It says continued steadfastly. Or your translation might say they were committed or they were devoted. This means that they weren't sporadic. This means that their participation wasn't dependent on the weather. Are you seeing that? Are you tracking with me? Uh, it says continued steadfastly. It didn't, it didn't matter what particular sports season they were in at that time. It wasn't as if life allows it, then I will go to church, or if I feel like it, then I'll be there. The people in the first church, they were faithful. They were dedicated. When the church met, the people were there. I mean, am I right? Is this what the text is saying? Am I getting the meaning of this text right? 
There are four things here that they were doing continuously, steadfastly. There are no excuses listed. They are participating, they are involved, and obviously they desire to hear the word of God and learn more and more. So friends, can I ask you a question this morning? Have you ever been hungry to hear God's word? Have you ever got to the point where you were thinking, I just can't wait to sit with my brothers and sisters in Christ and hear the word of God? One of my old friends, we got a picture up of her that's going to go on the screen, Mrs. Ruth Appling. She was getting dementia pretty bad in her late 80s, and her husband Jack was there at her house to help her. And even though she had dementia, she was in her house, she had her routine, she would come to church, and when she would come to church, she would often bring Andrea and I a fresh cut asparagus that she got out of her garden, and when the asparagus season was over later on in the summer, she would bring us other fresh veggies. But sadly, Jack died. We got the call that they were moving Jack from the hospital to the nursing home, and my wife and I got in the car and were driving straight to the nursing home, but uh, he passed about one minute after he arrived. And we were there with the family and we were there with Jack's body just a few minutes later. As you can imagine, Ruth was at a loss. You know, with the dementia she had, she didn't really know what was happening. But she wanted to be at home. She wanted to be with her familiar routine. The family decided that one of the nephews would move in with her and help and faithfully he brought Ruth to church every Sunday. And, and that's another interesting story that that nephew, he even started bringing his own Bible to church every Sunday. He told me that Sundays were her best day. And it seemed as if she was back to her old self as she said hello to everyone and made conversation. And it was almost as if there was no dementia when she was at church. Unfortunately, Ruth's nephew couldn't live with her forever. And after about a year or so, I don't remember exactly how long, maybe a year and a half, whatever it was, she had to move into an adult foster care home. After a few weeks of settling into her new home, her son began bringing her to church because that's all she talked about. Every day, she wanted to go to church. On Monday, Ruth would wake up and get dressed to go to church. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every day. And the workers at the home would have to explain to her that today is not Sunday, Ruth. Her mind was gone, her husband was gone, her house was gone, her routine, all of it gone, but she still wanted to be in church. When those workers would explain to Ruth that today isn't Sunday, she would sit down sobbing and crying because she wanted to go to church. I thought of Ruth this week, and I wondered, could we take a lesson from Ruth? I mean, if we won't learn from these first church people in Acts chapter 2 that continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, can we learn from Ruth? Those first believers in that first church, they continued steadfastly in doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. That first church was hungry. They couldn't get enough of it. So my question this morning is, what about us? What about you? 
I mean, I think if we all uh, sat down and had a conversation with one another, we could admit that we all know that God's word is his communication to us. We all know that that's how he wants us to learn about him. But unless we are dedicated to his word, we won't. Reminded of one of the Old Testament prophets, he said, uh, it was Hosea, he said, my, the people perish for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I think that's the number one problem in churches today is a lack of knowledge in God's word. People don't know the word of God because they are not continuing steadfastly in it. Now, another pastor so uh, eloquently reminded us that uh, uh, we need to remember that the goal of Bible study isn't just to know it. It is to live it and obey it. But the first necessity of a gospel-centered community is being dedicated to the study of the Word of God. The second is there in that list. It's to continue steadfastly in fellowship. Now, fellowship... I've noticed, especially in our church, since we got back from that those COVID lockdowns, remember when we had those weeks back and, and even the, the greater lockdowns throughout the state, it seems like since we've been back, when I say, uh, I'll see you later, that people stick around. There's one family, they're not here today, the Rulmans, they actually set back down. Have you noticed that? I say, you're dismissed, or I'll see you later. They actually set back down because there's this, this fellowship that they're hanging out and and fellowship is good. It's one of the four necessities of a gospel-centered community. But I, I think we need to be reminded about something because I'm, I'm up here preaching today, okay? Fellowship is not simply talking about your new lawnmower. Fellowship isn't talking about those new decorative pillows that you got at Marshall's. The, the, the word fellowship here is koinonia. Have you ever heard that word before? Koinonia? That's the Greek word that's translated fellowship. And it means to, to share of yourself or to give of yourself. You remember that show, Lord of the Rings? Anybody in here really like that movie? A few of you raise your hand. Justin, you really like that? Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was about a group of hobbits. You remember that? These hobbits and there's some elves and dwarves and there's this wizard and they wanted to destroy this ring. So they assemble this group and they unite around a mission. What did they want to do? And what was their mission? Sorry. Destroy the ring. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, when it was revealed to the council that the ring must be destroyed, the first volunteer was this little hobbit kid. I don't even remember his name. Anybody remember his name? Anybody a bigger dork than me? Now nobody's gonna say it, right? Um, <laughs> what? Frodo? Frodo, thank you. Thank you. And and if you remember the, the first guy, Aragorn or something, this powerful king, this great fighter, he steps up, and I got a picture of it, and, and he says, you can have my sword, remember? He volunteered. He says, you can have my sword. And then Legolas, that, that elf guy, that really fast fighter, he says, what does he say? You can have my bow. You remember that? And then that little dwarf guy, he walks up there with that big beard, and he's a stocky fella, and he says, you can have my axe. You remember that scene? I actually thought about playing it the whole scene. But, but in other words, what they were saying is, you can have my talents, to accomplish the mission. So they would give of themselves, they would give up their times, their talents to accomplish the mission of destroying the ring. Now, we kind of laugh about it, you know, this mission was all fantasy and kind of stupid because I could have melted that ring in my backyard in 10 minutes, right? Why do we have to go to the most terrible place and throw it in the volcano? I mean, you know, uh, but our mission, What's our mission? It's go into all the world and make disciples. That isn't fantasy. I mean, it's as real as it gets and, and what's at stake. Souls are at stake. So are you willing to go all in, you know, like those Lord of the Rings guys? I mean, what, what, what do you lay on the table? 
Are you giving anything to the anyone besides your presence? Are you using your talents in this church to accomplish God's mission? I mean, that's what biblical fellowship is, and what's the whole title of that movie, The, the Fellowship of the Ring, right? In fellowship, it's literally a giving of yourself. Now, it's defined more in verses 43 for, through 46. We're probably going to talk about it a little bit more tonight, but this isn't communism or <clears throat> socialism where you put everything in one pot and sort of live together and sing kumbaya. Uh, but uh, there are people out there that use these verses to support communism, progressivism, and socialist ideas. But that's not what's being advocated here. Now, you say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, look at verse 46. It says they broke bread from house to house. So they still owned their own homes, okay? It wasn't a giant collective. True biblical fellowship isn't communism where you own nothing and you're happy about it. It is a responsibility to the community. Koinonia means that we are partners together to accomplish God's mission of the church. Now, how do we do that? Uh, or how are you doing that? How are you doing in your fellowship? I'm talking about true biblical fellowship, the koinonia, this sharing of your life. I don't know if I can step on some toes this morning, but uh, I think it's the truth of the word of God. The apostles in the first church, the guy right here leading thousands of people to Jesus, I don't think that they would comprehend or tolerate a saved person who didn't get baptized and who didn't fellowship. That's an American thing. I know lots of people that get saved, they never get baptized, or they get saved and then they don't even go to church or hardly ever come to church, or you know anybody that hops from church to church to church? But the example here in the first church is to continue steadfastly in fellowship. You say, well, how can we do that? Well, here's one consideration. Uh, fellowship is more than just money. Fellowship is more than just giving money, although that's part of it. Here at our church, we have a Deacon's Benevolent Fund, and uh, currently there's about $4,000 there, and that is available to help you. You have a crazy, unexpected life circumstance. You have this big bill, and you're looking at your finances. You're not sure how it's going to go. Maybe it's not even a big bill. Maybe it's just pastor. Can you buy me groceries this week? Can you put some gas in my tank this week? That Deacon Care Fund, that is here to help this fellowship. That's one of the ways that our church comes together and tries to live out Acts chapter 2. People give to that. Did you know that we also have a special missions project fund to help missionaries when they're in need? You want to know how much money is in that account? About twelve thousand six hundred dollars. Amen. There's no question that you guys are very generous, but fellowship—it's more than money. It's a giving of yourself. It's sharing of yourself. It's doing ministry on Wednesday night after work, even though you are tired. You still come to church. You still love those kids. You come in and give your all to those teens and to those children. Fellowship is looking after our good friend Marv. I don't think he can even hear me right now. It's looking after him, even though he doesn't really listen to you sometimes, even though you get frustrated with him sometimes because he does something that you have told him not to do 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 other times. That's fellowship. Fellowship is dropping off a meal at Caudell's when Pete was in the hospital. Fellowship is going over to Jeremy and Melinda's house and helping them tear their roof off. Fellowship is coming alongside our brother Dan 
that is moving to West Virginia. It's upholding him in our prayers as he adjusts to a new house and finds a new church. But pastor, I'm here. Aren't you happy? I'm here. I'm here. Isn't that good enough? Well, not to Peter, James, and John, it wouldn't be. So what are you bringing to the table? What are you sharing? <laughs> you know, it's so easy to get into that habit of just being here and doing the first part. I did the first part. I, I listened to the sermon. I was listening to the doctrine. And then all of a sudden we forget the koinonia part. You know, I love you guys. And that's why we go through books and chapters and we look at each verse. And I'll tell you why I do that. When I go chapter by chapter, book by book, verse by verse, um, I then have what's called plausible deniability. You know what I'm getting at? <laughs> if I skip around and, and look at different verses, you could have a legit gripe. You could come to me and say, Pastor, you picked out that verse and you were picking on me. For instance, I could look at a, a verse in the Bible and I could cherry pick out a verse and I could and I could preach on it and you could say, Pastor, you're picking on me. I could do that. I could pick a topic. I could make up a series. There's a lot of pastors, a lot of churches that do that. And it would all be biblical. But you could say, Pastor, I know it based upon what I told you on that phone conversation, on that text. I know that you did this to, to pick on me. But the beauty of going through a book is that we're just going in order. We're seeing what comes next. So that means as I give you these applications from Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, I am not picking on anyone. And if you feel like maybe I am, it could be that it's the word of God that's sharp as a two-edged sword, that's cutting to your heart, or it could be the conviction of the Holy Spirit telling you to make a change. It says the people received the word of God. They were baptized. Then they were added to the church. All of these are expected actions for a believer. And then it says they devoted themselves to learning the word of God, loving each other, and breaking bread and praying for each other. Very quickly, we don't have much time left. Breaking of bread is sharing in communion, which is more than just drinking the little juice and eating that little tiny piece of cracker. When we gather to communion, which, by the way, we're doing that this evening, uh, what we are doing is confessing our sins together collectively as a body of Christ, and we are remembering what Jesus did on the cross together. So it's a ceremony that we do that is intended to bring unity within the church. The verse says, 3,120 continued steadfastly in studying the word of God, fellowship, communion, and finally, prayers. Now, it's interesting if you do a detailed word study in the Greek, uh, uh, <clears throat> the word prayer has an article in front of it. So it's actually the prayers. A lot of commentators speculate on what that means, but I think it is referring to serious prayers about learning the will of God and seeking wisdom. Class, I bring that up because it's so easy to move through life and make decisions based upon what? Our experience, our gut feelings. You know, all of these different things, our, our political leanings. We can sort of move through life and do all these things without ever praying for wisdom without ever bringing a care or concern to the church family. But if we get a stubbed toe, what are we doing? We're sending that prayer request to Dawn and it's texted out to everybody, you know, uh, Tom Cavanaugh stubbed his toe at work, pray for him today. We'll get that prayer request like, like faster than fast. But when we are desperately in need of spiritual help or needing wisdom from the Lord, maybe Don will get a call 
and give it an unspoken prayer request. Got a quiz for you this morning, class. Uh, on the last prayer sheet that we had handed out last Wednesday night, how many unspoken prayer requests are listed on there? Nine. Nine. I dare say that some of those unspoken prayer requests are probably more urgent than some of those health needs that have been on that list for months and never been updated. What I'm saying is how often are we together in prayer for someone in our midst who is in serious spiritual trouble or who needs some direction and wisdom from above? We don't often do that because those are sensitive subjects. So we just call them unspoken. Imagine with me, okay? Imagine with me for a minute the victory my friend from another state that calls me, him or his wife call me at least once or twice a week and, and seeking counseling. Imagine the victory he could have in his marriage if he went to his Wednesday night prayer meeting and said, I'm losing my wife and I need help. I need you guys to pray for me. And I hope my friend's watching this. We don't pray like that. We come to our Wednesday night and say, we have a sore knee, or my granddaughter fell on her skateboard. But, you know, the prayers, these people, I think, were vulnerable, and they were very real in front of their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But we don't like to do that. Sometimes I think we care more about what people think instead of what we should actually be doing as a church. So as we're finishing up this morning, please look at verse 47. <clears throat> so this church was doing those four necessities of what they should be doing as a, a church. These, they were very faithful in doing these four things. So look at the reaction of the world around them. Number one, it says they had favor in the eyes of the people. So the world was looking at them in a very good light because of those four things that they were doing. So folks, I could ask, I, I don't know if I will, but I could ask, I'm going to, what is our reputation as a church in this community? Do we have favor in the eyes of the people? Number two, it says, the Lord added to them daily. Daily. Can you imagine salvations happening on a daily basis? I mean, we're not talking about, you know, I led a little girl to the Lord six years ago on Wednesday night or at VBS or whatever. We're talking about salvations daily. So this church shows us the way to fulfill the mission that Jesus Christ gave us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And we need to grab this. We're almost done. There is a connection between how we get along and how we impact the world around us. So how can we be a church if we aren't following the Bible? We tout as the word of God or have relationships that cost us nothing if we refuse to confess our sins or be vulnerable to one another and truly care for each other. You know, one of the most powerful witnesses that we could possibly have as a gospel-centered community is that we are unified and loving each other. Uh, I like what one pastor said. He said, true evangelism begins with a healthy church. And that means this church in Acts 2 was so successful in ministry because they were studying the word of God together. They were loving each other. They were breaking bread and they were praying for one another. True evangelism begins with a healthy church. Last question, what will you invite people to? 
what will you invite people to? Have you ever been in a church situation that was so bad you were embarrassed to invite somebody to the service? <laughs> yeah, we've been there, right? You look at the schedule and you think, oh, so-and-so is singing this Sunday. I'm not inviting my friend or the, 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 this or that is so bad. We're not inviting people. You've probably been there one time or another. To avoid that embarrassing situation, our church has to have these four essentials. And when our church has these four essentials, God can use us in a powerful way to further his kingdom. Let's close. Father God, uh, I, I'm thankful that your Holy Spirit was active this week and brought to my mind Ruth, her story. I was able to find her picture. We're thankful for that. Lord, we see from the word of God that these people were hungry to be in the word, hungry to have fellowship, hungry to have communion and, and to pray for one another. And people were just giving and open and whatever the need was, it came up and it was taken care of. And Lord, People were coming to that church even more. Thousands more we see in the next chapter are saved. They're just drawn to it. May that be us as a church. May that be our story. Lord, if there's some little thing we need to tweak or some big major change that we need to do, mindset, whatever it is, based upon these, this passage, based upon these fundamentals, these necessities of a church, help us to do that. Help us not to uh, drag our feet. Lord, I pray for those nine unspokens that maybe they would have the courage to come on a Wednesday night and be open with those people that are faithfully praying. <coughs> of what their spiritual need or emotional need is. Lord, help us to be a church that truly, truly fellowships and prays for one another. Lord, I think of communion tonight that even if it's a small group that's here, that it would just bring us close together, that we would be unified as a church. Lord, your word is speaking, and I'm thankful for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can stand up. So tonight, when we dig deeper in Acts chapter 2, we're going to be talking about two concepts. Uh, what is prescriptive and what is descriptive in Acts chapter 1 and 2. You know, it's, it was just a fascinating thing that I had never really thought about. So we're going to be talking about that tonight. Then we're going to also talk about what are you looking for in a church. Not necessarily that you're out searching for a church, but when you were looking what were the things you were looking for? So I'd love to see you back tonight for that and communion. We'll see you later.